Um, we are really happy to have you all with us with our Fulbright Forum tonight, celebrating the 75th anniversary of Fulbright with one of our events. And we're looking forward to an enjoyable evening. Um, I'm Patrice Moulton. I'm president of the Louisiana chapter. And I just need to take a few minutes as we're getting started to say thank you to um, all of our co-host chapters that jumped in with us to make tonight possible. So thanks um, to the Fulbright Association for always supporting us. And when we have ideas being there for us and to the staff for being so great. And I'd just like to mention real quickly the chapters that are involved with us tonight. And I hope we have representation in the house from all of our chapters. We've got um, obviously Louisiana's in the house. We had Minnesota, a Walden University virtual chapter. We have North Carolina chapter, our Washington uh, National Capital Area chapter, San Antonio, Kentucky, Massachusetts, South Carolina, New Jersey, Mississippi, Arizona, Georgia, Central Ohio, Houston, and Rhode Island that all agreed to co-sponsor and share the word about our program. So thank you guys so much for being collaborative and um, jumping in with us. So tonight we've got what I hope is a relaxed, enjoyable evening. We have Bill who is right now um, letting one of his puppies out the back door. That is How appropriate. <laughs> Bill to be a joy. Um, Bill is a gifted storyteller, um, a, a music lover, a dog dad, a world traveler. Um, uh, and he is also happens to be an Episcopal priest. And more than anything, you will find that Bill is a decent human being that you will enjoy your time listening to. And his stories and his experiences are inspiring. And I think as we're moving towards um, Valentine's, it was a good time to kind of stop and take a minute just to think about love and laughter and the importance of both in our world today. So I'll turn it over to Bill, and I hope you enjoy the next 45 minutes or so to just kick back, relax, and be inspired a little. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. I am uh, really honored to be with you all. And this is an experiment because I have one of my dogs, Waylon Wailua Jelly Roll Jennings. He's with me tonight. And so if you hear any random howling, uh, hopefully that will be Waylon and not me. Uh, but I just want to celebrate you and your organization, your purpose of connecting us and helping us understand one another across the globe is such important work. It's so critical and crucial to our survival and well-being as a planet and as a people. I have a favorite medieval mystic, uh, doesn't everybody? Uh, it was Meister Eckhart, and he once said, if the only prayer you ever utter is thank you, that would be enough. And so I want to begin with that prayer and just say thank you for all that you are and all that you do. I don't have to tell you that times have been very challenging for a lot of us who inhabit this planet, uh, at least the human uh, species. Our animal friends, especially our dogs, have been having a blast for the past 10 months, as many of us have been working from home. Uh, but lately, when people ask me, how are you doing? How are you hanging in there? We know it's been tough. Um, I have to say, without denying or diminishing the hard work that is ahead of all of us, uh, I'm really hopeful and I'm really grateful. And I'm hoping that you are hopeful as well and maybe hopeful at the end of our presentation tonight. And if not more hopeful, then at least slightly amused and maybe you can forget your trials and troubles and tribulations and challenges for a few moment, moments. I wanted to thank uh, Patrice for that very kind and generous introduction and tell you just a little bit about myself, but much more about my dogs. Uh, other than my wife, they are the most significant loves in my life. I have been blessed uh, to travel quite a bit on this planet and also to love some really extraordinary beasts and uh, two of the three books are about my canine companions. The first one was The Gospel According to Sam, Animal Stories for the Soul. Uh, the second book I wrote was The Beer Drinker's Guide to God, The Whole and Holy Truth About Lager Loving and Living. And doing research on that book was uh, a blast. Let me just say that, a joy. 
And the latest one that just came out this past October is called The Last Hallelujah Tales from the Trail. And it's about a most unusual 5,000 mile road trip I took with my dying dog. His name was Willie and the important lessons that we learned along the way. And I've been really blessed to live in some wonderful places over the years, Texas, Chicago, the beautiful island of Kauai for 10 years, and now in Louisiana near New Orleans. And as a music lover, that has been an incredible uh, gift. As Patrice said, I'm an Episcopal priest. Uh, that's my day job and sometimes my night job. Uh, don't hold that against me. If you don't know what that means, uh, the Anglican tradition is sort of a fusion of Celtic spirituality with Catholicism. And I describe my own approach uh, towards spirituality as universal and pluralistic. And I believe that truth is everywhere, especially in the natural world, if we're curious and open enough to look for it, to see it, to appreciate it and celebrate it. Um, I've also owned a bar and music venue in Texas. It was a bar called Padres. It was in a quirky little modern art mecca called Marfa, way out in far west Texas. If you don't know about Marfa, you should Google it, or better, you should travel there because you have to see it uh, to believe it. So I think the most important role I have uh, right now, and probably for the last decade or so, speaking of my children, uh, is that I've been a, a dad, uh, a dog dad to some really wonderful and blessed beasts. Uh, that's Waylon Wailua Jennings, who just uh, walked in the room again. Uh, I had Sam Houston. He was my 82-pound Airedale Terrier, and he was the inspiration for a first book. He was uh, in a fire when he was a puppy, and the neighbors dramatically rescued him and saved his life, risking their own lives in the process. And I learned uh, from that experience, what it means to be a neighbor. And uh, Sam ended up losing his ears in the fire and he became known as the Fearless Earless Airedale. And that became a book. Um, there was also my one in a million uh, dog, not Willie Willie Nelson. Uh, by the way, this is, uh, <laughs> this is what happens when you live in a dog house with six dogs. So uh, uh, I think uh, oh, here. Oh, well, everybody's here now. OK, here is Mahalia Jackson, Queen Lily Kalani. This was quite unplanned. She is my beautiful girl Pitbull, who is from New Orleans, and uh, she is named after two favorite musicians, Mahalia Jackson and the composer king of uh, Hawaii, Queen Lily Kalani. Uh, dogs do not come to me unless they have a story to share or uh, a very interesting personality to live with. Uh, I think I saw Mono the shark, that's the Hawaiian word for shark. Uh, he's also called Professor Shorthair, named uh, more or less after the great Bogalusa Blues pianist, Professor Longhair. Um, I think uh, that's enough on the dogs. We'll see who else wanders in. Um, Waylon is named, of course, for Waylon Jennings and also for Jelly Roll Morton, who claimed to have invented jazz and historians have a rather difficult time disproving him, so why not? I think you know what's coming up on uh, this Sunday. It's February 14th. It's Valentine's Day, for better or for worse. And I will be very forthright and admit that some of my Valentine's Days have been less than stellar. And so I chose as my title tonight, Very Superstitious About Love. And with that title, I acknowledge uh, my own superstition, my own suspicion, if not skepticism, about this elusive mystery that we call love, even though I've been charged and I've been called with helping others understand it, believe in it, and practice it. Uh, the title also, I think, alludes to a certain Stevie Wonder song that may have come to mind because, quite frankly, you can't go wrong with Stevie Wonder. And anytime a song or any art form comes to mind, I think we find ourselves on the scent of a deeper truth, one that may go beyond reason and rational thought. In my own life and on my own journey, the Sufi poets have spoken to me uh, over the years in a, in a profound and simple way. 
Uh, Sufism itself is a kind of elusive mysticism that has as its hallmarks introspection, connection, tolerance, and pluralism. And one cleric I heard, a cleric and historian, said this about the tradition, this way is ultimately about opening the heart. And I think whenever we open our hearts and our minds and our eyes, uh, we will learn and we will learn to live and to love. So the topic for tonight is love. And I found that in my search for such ultimate truth, it is poetry rather than prose that is most illuminating. And not all the poets we'll hear from tonight are Sufi poets, but all of them, uh, by the way, the best laid plans. Uh, I was supposed to be in here with one dog and now there are at least four and counting. <laughs> Uh, but all of, the, uh, all of the poets that we'll hear from tonight do approach this topic of love with a kind of reverence and mystery and playfulness, which I think is a wonderful and rare combination. And the translations I will use tonight, if there are any uh, Sufi scholars in the audience tonight, uh, I'm an expert and authority on nothing, really. Uh, but the translations that I use tonight are from Daniel Ladinsky and some scholars think that perhaps Ladinsky took some liberties with words as passed down, but I think his exuberance and sense of humor and really his dance with rather than around them or just what the modern reader and the modern lover need to hear. So we're gonna pair these poems with some stories uh, because I think just as poetry can speak more perceptively or at least lyrically than prose, perhaps stories resonate for most of us beyond mere fact. As one social psychologist has observed, the human mind is a story processor, not a logic processor. And if that is true of the human mind, imagine what must be true of the human heart. A writer acquaintance has written uh, something even more applicable to our topic. He wrote, dogs sniff each other, human beings tell stories. This is our natural language. So we recite poems and we share stories and in so doing, we draw closer to one another and even to our intended and most noble purpose, which is to love one another and to love all of the created order as well as the created disorder. And the subtitle of tonight's presentation is Clues from Creation. And by creation, of course, I mean my favorite part of creation, and that is, as you can see, the canine realm, what I consider to be the creator's best work. Now, nothing against humans. Some of my best friends are human, uh, but dogs just seem to be a bit closer to the heart of the matter and to the heart of what really matters. So I wanna begin with a favorite poem and a favorite story, and I'm gonna deviate from the Sufi tradition, but this is very much in the mystical tradition. Uh, that mystic I quoted at the very beginning, uh, Meister Eckhart. And this is a poem titled, The Hope of Loving. What keeps us alive? What allows us to endure? I think it is the hope of loving or being loved. I heard a fable once about the sun going on a journey to find its source and how the moon wept without her lover's warm gaze. We weep when light does not reach our hearts. We wither like fields. If someone close does not rain their kindness upon us. I have a favorite uh, story about a person who most unexpectedly became a favorite person. This is from uh, the book titled The Beer Drinker's Guide to God. And the story is titled The Clueless Heart. And uh, perhaps you've had the experience of dealing with an extraordinarily difficult person and thinking that there is no, uh, no way you would ever uh, call them friend or partner or beloved in any way. And uh, sometimes love and friendship uh, surprise us. And that certainly happened. I want to read a portion of the story. 
it was, uh, it begins really with the Valentine's Day gift. My favorite Valentine's gift that year was one I received unexpectedly from an unlikely suitor. Her name was Imogene Horton. To say that our relationship got off on the wrong foot is to minimize the impact of planting a foot on the south side of a north side of a northbound priest. My first impression of her was that she was a hypercritical, judgmental, non-humorous, unforgiving bag of wind. If you have ever read How to Deal with Difficult People, Imogene's photo appears in the chapter titled No Deal. Imogene was the church librarian and no-nonsense retired high school English teacher who took meticulous notes and no prisoners, especially with regard to my own grammatical, homiletical, theological, liturgical, and relational activities and articulations. She believed the only appropriate words in the English language were those in circulation before 1645, and that unless one worshiped in formal stilted Elizabethan phrases, one was wasting one's time and risking the creator's displeasure. On my first day at my new church, she marched into my office in possession of a serious scowl and informed me, I am Emma Jean Horton and I am quality control around here. For the next few years, not a week went by that Emma Jean did not criticize, offend, judge, alienate, or upset somebody, often me. The negative energy surrounding her was almost palpable and not particularly present, pleasant. Over time, Emma Jean began to lighten up. The tension accompanying our verbal exchanges and her physical presence began to dissipate. Our eyes met more frequently. A smile crept onto her unsuspecting lips on more than one occasion. She would still sling barbs of outrageous criticism my way, but they were less poisonous, more like nerf-tipped arrows, clever and teasing more than punishing and derogatory. Then came the Valentine's Day when she approached me in the church hallway with a mischievous gleam in her eyes and a flirty smirk on her face. Father Miller, she intoned, I have a special Valentine's Day gift for you. It is just for you. It has your name written all over it. Now hold out your hand. I held out my hand and Imogene placed into my palm one of those tiny pink candy hearts that have been around for decades. The kind that read, be mine, hugs and kisses, cutie pie, I love you, sweetheart. I could not believe that one, Imogene Horton was giving me a Valentine's Day gift and two, the gift was a precious little candy heart with a tender sentiment inscribed thereupon. Now read it, she instructed as she cast an almost coquettish and certainly coy glance in my direction and friskily pranced her way back toward the church library. I opened my palm and beheld printed in bold red letters on a tiny pink heart, a one word sentiment, clueless. That tiny Valentine's Day offering still occupies a place of honor, not only in my treasure chest, but also in my heart. When I announced I was leaving to move to the island of Kauai, if I hadn't known better, I would have sworn that Imogene's eyes got a bit misty with emotion. Imogene presented me with a gift basket with a stuffed lion, a poem about pink flamingos, and then a note. The note began with a sentence that was so ludicrous and off target, I wasn't sure whether to laugh derisively, scoff haughtily, accuse her threateningly, or point a lethal weapon toward the library. The very nerve of this woman. After all I had put up with in relation to her antics, despite everything, I had forgiven, loved, and stayed the course with her through all of those critical judgments and self-esteem, deflating glances of displeasure. Her note began, I am so glad I did not give up on understanding you. 
what? Have you lost your mind? You are glad that you did not give up on understanding me, you lunatic of language and tormentor of truth. Have you not reversed your subject and object? You have our relationship backward. Your words are inaccurate, inverted, illogical, and defensive. Your statement is as faulty and fallacious as that candy heart sentiment you gave me back on Valentine's Day. Do you not recognize that I am the one who never gave up on understanding you, that I am the one that kept on loving you, that I am the one who looked way past your faults and into that tiny remnant of an actual beating heart? Obviously, somebody here is entirely clueless, and it's not me. I will miss you terribly, she concluded. Love, Imogene. I would miss her terribly too. And I love her still for who she is, who she was, who she is becoming, and who she shall be. And for speaking the truth in love and for never giving up on understanding me. So I approach Valentine's Day, I think fondly about Emma Jean Horton and all those like her who may have been perceived as difficult or even obnoxious, but who really taught me the essence of love, never giving up, of persistence, of looking for those clues from creation and from our fellow human beings. Next, I have a group of poems from the Sufi tradition and they're grouped thematically. And the theme, I guess, is that when we begin to quantify or calculate love, it eludes us. In love, there is no scale, there is no measure, there is no scorecard, and there is definitely no spreadsheet. This is a poem by Kabir. It's titled, It Stops Working. Look what happens to the scale when love holds it. It stops working. When love holds and upholds, the scale simply doesn't work doesn't need to, what would you weigh? This is a poem by Hafiz, and it's titled, Forgiveness is the Cash. Forgiveness is the cash you need. All other kinds of silver really buy just strange things. Everything has its music. Everything has genes of God inside, but learn from those courageous, addicted lovers of glands and opium and gold. Look, they cannot jump high or laugh long when they are whirling. And the moon and the stars become sad when their tender light is used for night wars. Forgiveness is part of the treasure you need to craft your falcon wings and return to your true realm of divine freedom. One other poem, and this is a, a personal favorite. It's also by Hafiz. It's called, The Sun Never Says. The Sun Never Says. Even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights the whole world. I learned a lot about love from my beasts and uh, especially my first one, Sam. 
I learned about how we take our chances in love. And this is a, a short portion of a story that I titled Dog Spelled Backwards. And it's about what happens when the objects of our affection disappoint us, our possible responses and the loving one. I live fairly simply and don't have many valuable possessions. My ex-wife took the Doonesbury original, so I'm down to a small collection of priceless ancient antiquities, a Hellenistic oil lamp, a Roman plate, a Bronze Age cup, and the most beautiful and valuable, a lovely juglet from the Iron Age, simply yet exquisitely crafted in perfect condition. The archaeologist I purchased them from in Jerusalem was most reluctant to part with the juglet. This timeless piece had survived war, drought, famine, occupation, revolution, the birth of a couple of world religions, and cultural chaos for several millennia. Ironically, it could not survive a few hours with Sam. When I got home that day, Sam had knocked the 3,000-year-old juglet off the shelf and onto the floor and had broken off a large chunk of its elegant neck. I stood there stunned. I had several options, Sam stakes, a sadistic spanking, and SPCA-sanctioned safari. Instead, I just forgave him. He may be one blankety-blank dog, but he is my blankety blank dog. And that makes all the difference. We take our chances in love uh, and it's worth it, especially if we're able to look beyond our lovers, lovers' faults and practice forgiveness. Two poems uh, I really love by female poets, Rabia of Basra, and uh, someone you might recognize, Mary Oliver. And the themes of these two poems related to love are presence, faithfulness, what Oliver calls steadfastness or loyalty. This is such a short and sweet poem by Rabia of Basra. It's called One Day. One day, he did not leave after kissing me. And Mary Oliver, this is a book of poetry called Dog Songs, because uh, two of my three books are about my canine companions. People gift me with dog-themed literature. I have an entire library of dog books. Uh, and some of the poetry that I'm quite fond of, I have a couple of books of poetry actually written by dogs. One of them is titled, If Only You Knew How Much I Smell You. And uh, a favorite poem uh, from that collection uh, goes like this. What does that mean, expensive shoe? I ate it because it smells like you. And then recently, uh, a good friend who works with me uh, with my Hallelujah Foundation, which is a charitable foundation that helps animals, uh, that was inspired by my dog, now Willie Willie Nelson. Um, the book is actually titled Throw the Damn Ball. And <laughs> there are a number of wonderful poems in that book. Uh, a beautiful, absorbent land. The cone sets a tone all its own and lick and let lick. So some great poems written by dogs. But this poem is written by a human and it's written about dogs. And the title of this poem is How It Is With Us and How It Is With Them. We become religious, then we turn from it. Then we are in need and maybe we turn back. We turn to making money. Then we turn to the moral life. Then we think about money again. We meet wonderful people, but lose them in our busyness. We're, as the saying goes all over the place, steadfastness 
it seems, is more about dogs than about us. One of the reasons we love them so much. So back in the summer of 2017, I went on the greatest adventure of my life. It was called the Last Hallelujah Tour. My dog, Willie, back in November of 2016, had been given three months to live. Uh, he had terminal cancer. And he ended up living for 18 months. And so that summer, we went on this 5,000-mile road trip from Las Vegas, uh, or from New Orleans to Las Vegas. And there were really three reasons that we went on the tour. We did want to raise awareness and raise funds for our animal friends in need. And uh, years later, Willie has raised over $50,000 to help his animal friends. And secondly, we wanted to remind people of the true priorities of life, which we sometimes forget. And those priorities are really our relationships with those we love, who love us back, our partners, our spouses, our children, our parents, our grandchildren, our friends. And then finally, I wanted to spend time with my best friend. We weren't sure how much time he had. And what better way to simply be with your best friend than to go on a 5,000 mile road trip. And this book, The Last Hallelujah Tales from the Trail, uh, it's a collection of stories of people we met and adventures we shared and truths that we learned along the way. There's a story near the end of the book and it ties in beautifully, I think, with this theme of presence and faithfulness and steadfastness and loyalty. And the title of the story is He Waits for Me. And I'll just read a couple of paragraphs. While his physical prowess diminished over the years, his relational capacities only increased. While his walks grew shorter and slower, his love grew larger and greater. When there were finally four of us, Willie, Lily, Sinbad, and I, the dogs no longer had free range status in the house. But don't feel sorry for the banished beasts. They had the entire back third of the house, including the kitchen, dining room, hangout room, couch, big screen television, and most importantly, the refrigerator. There were also six dog beds back there, just in case anyone got lucky and had a canine sleepover but I still let the three of them sleep in my bedroom every night. We had a ritual, a kind of preparatory sacramental process for slumber. They would watch the clock and my movements. And the minute I reached to remove the dog gate and said, let's go to bed, the race was on. Lily would dart like a freight train through the living room, a blur crossing the length of the house and go flying into my bed. Even slow Sinbad would leap and bound like a bunny at full speed all the way onto his special posturepedic mattress on the bedroom floor, but not Willie. Willie always waited for me. He'd walk slowly to the living room and then stop. He'd move no further. He'd turn around and look for me, and only when he saw that I'd caught up with him would he walk alongside me to the bedroom. If I was ever delayed, Willie would still stay put and wait. He'd never go on without me. Willie always waited. Two poems. The themes of these two poems would really be about paying attention and paying compliments to your lover, enjoying each other and laughing together. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, as an Episcopal priest, I've done the premarital counseling for about 300 couples, but it was only uh, a couple of months ago on November 28th, 
that I needed the premarital counseling for myself. Uh, I was blessed to meet a wonderful woman from New Orleans. Her name is Sandy. And uh, one of the things uh, that happens between the two of us is that we pay a lot of compliments to each other. We try to go easy on criticism and we laugh a lot. We were married on November 28th and we joked together that on November 30th, uh, we were going to collaborate on a video series called The Marriage Minute with Bill and Sandy. And uh, the title of our first episode, we decided was going to be The Secret to Our Longevity. And the subtitle was going to be Brevity. So this poem is by Rumi. And um, let's see if I can find it here. It's called Relationship Booster. Here it is. <laughs> Free relationship advice. Here is a relationship booster that is guaranteed to work. Every time your spouse or lover says something stupid, make your eyes light up as if you just heard something brilliant. <laughs> I've experienced that in my own life, in my own relationship, and I've certainly experienced it with my dogs who look at me like uh, I have just said the most brilliant thing that has ever been spoken, or I have just achieved the most extraordinary feat uh, that has ever been achieved. These two poems are not from the Sufis, but from St. Teresa, and the theme is learning to laugh together. Uh, the first poem is called Laughter Came From Every Brick, and the second one is called Not Yet Tickled. <laughs> Just these two words he spoke changed my life. Enjoy me. What a burden I thought I was to carry a, a crucifix, as did he. Love once said to me, I know a song. Would you like to hear it? And laughter came from every brick in the street and from every pore in the sky. After a night of prayer, he changed my life when he sang, enjoy me. This is one uh, I'd like to read to my fellow clergy. Um, my books are a little unique in that I incorporate humor uh, into my take on spirituality. And sometimes when I'm lecturing or doing a book event, I ask by show of hands, how many of people have read anything spiritual lately that made them laugh? Generally, no hands go up, or one or two. This poem is titled, Not Yet Tickled. How did those priests ever get so serious and preach all that gloom? I don't think God tickled them yet. Beloved, hurry. <laughs> I like to share with people that I think one of the great heresies of contemporary spirituality is that the spiritual quest is not filled with humor. And uh, I believe that it is. And I've written about it in all of my books. There was uh, one story that I titled in Sam called A Lighter Shade of Tail. And it's about how our dogs teach us uh, how to laugh at the silliest things. There's one... Uh, story I want to share with you at the end, because I think in some ways it summarizes some of the things I've been trying to share tonight. Um, it's toward the end of that chapter that began with Imogene Horton, titled The Clueless Heart. And uh, it's some observations about love. And uh, it begins at a rehearsal dinner toast of a good friend of mine, this was back in New Jersey. Like a friend said in his rehearsal dinner toast to his bride-to-be, I just want you to know, sweetheart, that you make my stomach churn. 
Most everyone in attendance agreed that the groom meant she gives him sweet little butterflies fluttering around with their precious tiny wings inside his tummy. He just got his metaphors a bit mixed up and his manner of speech confused. I beg to differ. Who made butterflies the official mascot for love? I vote for butter as a much more likely expression of true love. Butter that was formed over time from a questionable substance that was coaxed out of a cow in a most intimate, if not awkward procedure. It is then churned slowly until it becomes something tasty and beautiful and makes my ass look big, but that's okay because you love me so much that I make your stomach churn. We are far too quick to think we get it. Then we, when we find that we don't, we are far too quick to assume we never had it and never will get it. That's not how love works. Love works and waits. Love takes time to hear the rest of the story and even to rewrite and edit the tale as it unfolds. Love takes the initiative and stays the course. In love, if you wanna be understood, understand. If you wanna be heard, listen. If you want to be forgiven, forgive. If you want to be loved, love. First impressions, fleeting feelings, initial mis misunderstandings, casting premature judgment, giving up too soon. These are all roadblocks on the way to encountering the greatest of these, which is love. So go ahead and play the fool. In so doing, over time, you will look far less foolish. When it comes to love, we are all novices, attempting to understand and communicate something that is far beyond our capacity to comprehend. Of one thing we can be sure, there are no secrets, but there are clues. Clues like patience, forgiveness, a sense of humor, heavy compliments, rare criticism, taking the initiative. Such love calls for a long-term commitment, space for evolution and change, the willingness to hear and write the rest of the story. Risk, sacrifice, compromise, lots of butter, and perhaps an occasional butterfly. To love is to press on, despite the hurtful conditions, the churning stomachs, and the clueless hearts. All right, I think we're out of time. And uh, of course I have chosen an inexhaustible topic and I have inexhaustible stories as there are inexhaustible poems. But I do wanna close uh, with one by Hafiz. And this is titled, The Subject Tonight is Love. The subject tonight is love. And for tomorrow night as well. As a matter of fact, I know of no better topic for us to discuss until we all die. Or perhaps until we all truly live. Thanks for having me tonight and uh, for putting up with me and my rowdy pups <laughs> who barged in on our time, just like uh, they barge in on my writing and on my life. And I'm very grateful for those interruptions because uh, that is the stuff of true love. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, I hope all of you that have been in attendance tonight have just enjoyed kind of taking a moment of, of, of escape from the craziness of all of our lives and a chance to just kind of sit back and reflect and hopefully got a moment of, of laughter and you will find moments of joy and you were inspired um, for a moment as well. Um, one of my takeaways is right in the very beginning of this bill when you said that you know we're called to love the created disorder and i think that's something that fulbrighters particularly 
can relate to. We find ourselves all over the world in the most unusual circumstances in cultures that we know nothing about, but want to understand and love and be a part of. And Fulbright is all about building relationships and, um, and sharing with one another in the world to try to make it a better place. So it's an extraordinary group of people to be a part of, um, one that I'm honored to share um, an affiliation with. And we really appreciate you being here with us tonight and giving us some moments to stop and take a breath. And I wish you all a uh, happy Valentine's this weekend as we're thinking about love. And I hope you have a Valentine's full of joy. And I hope you take some time to um, spread some love around. And if you want to hear more from Bill, we have put his contact information in the chat. You can find it there. You can find him on Facebook to connect with him if you would like to. Um, you are all free to connect with me at any time through email, through Fulbrighter. Um, would love to hear from you. Again, thank you to our co-sponsors and to the Fulbright Association and happy Valentine's everyone. Thank you, Bill. Good night. Thank you. Good night.